Well, what we've got here is the great proof text that our friends in the Church of Rome used to say that the, the uh, Lord's Supper, the communion, is literally the body and blood of Jesus. After all, have a look at like verse 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. There it is. You've got to literally eat Jesus' body and blood to have life in you. But of course we've got to read the whole context, don't we? Because he says a little later on, down in verse 63, the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. <clears throat> He's speaking about spiritual things. He's speaking metaphorically. And of course, uh, we do the same thing when, we're, when we speak about eating and, and, and so on. Uh, one of the uh, commentators, Beasley Murray, points out, we devour books, uh, we swallow stories, we chew over a matter, we even eat our own words. In other words, we use the same kind of metaphoric language. Now, this is not speaking about the Lord's Supper because, well, for one thing, um, if, if he was speaking about the Lord's Supper, how would those first listeners have understood that he was talking about the Lord's Supper when he hasn't instituted it yet at this stage. It wouldn't have made any sense to them. What would they have been thinking? That didn't happen until chapter 13. Now, Jesus is teaching something every bit as important, if not more important here, that we want to enter into. In fact, what, what we're getting uh, a glimpse of here is not only the wonder of of who Jesus is, but, but the genius of John in the way he's put this gospel together. See, see, John says at the end, remember he has a purpose statement, John 20 verse 31, that I, I, I'm going to give you, I could have written enough stuff about Jesus to fill all the books in the world, but I've given you these so that you can believe. So try and picture, you're one of those first readers of John back there in the first century, Especially those Jewish believers and who, who, if you're going to believe, it's going to put your life on the line, at least your everyday life. You're going to get kicked out of the synagogue. You'll be out of society and so on. You've got to know that Jesus really is the Messiah. How are you going to prove that to me, John? And what John's been doing is unfolding through this gospel so far <clears throat> the Jews are looking forward to a Messiah who is going to be a prophet like Moses, only greater. And we've seen already in this gospel, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ in chapter 1, verse 17. Then a little further on, what was that ladder in the Old Testament that Jacob saw leading up into heaven? Well, John has explained us through Jesus' teaching there was actually Jesus. That Old Testament ladder was pointing to Jesus. He is the way up to heaven. And then we got, we've gone on a little further and we've, we've seen uh, and asked the question, what, what is the Old Testament temple all about? What was it all about? Well, we learned in chapter 2, it was actually all about Jesus. He is the way into God. And then in, in chapter 3, the, and again, a reference by John to, to, through Jesus' words to that Old Testament occurrence of that snake being lifted up to save the people of God. What was all that about? It was about Jesus who would be lifted up. John chapter 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus, it was Jesus who had to be lifted up to the cross to save his people. And then as we've, we've continued on now, we're, we're looking at, and we've already seen in this gospel, even the Old Testament believers eating was actually pointing to Jesus. The Passover lamb 
who is the true Passover lamb. We've learned it in John from John the Baptist. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now as we come to this section, we're learning what was that manna really all about? Was it just to feed the people as they were grumbling in the desert? Well, it turns out it was all pointing to Jesus. He is the true bread of life that has come down from heaven. You see what John's doing? And we haven't even begun in this gospel. We're early days still in chapter 6. Because as we go through this gospel, we're going to see it's all about Jesus. I hope this inspires you to go back and read that Old Testament again with fresh eyes. Read it through this lens. You know what that Old Testament is all about? Everything, even down to that bread coming down, that manna coming down from heaven, the temple and all these things. And we're going to learn a whole lot more things about these festivals and all these things in the Old Testament. It was all about Jesus. So start reading that Old Testament again. Start looking for Jesus in the Old Testament with, with the understanding now of all that we have from the New Testament. Well, let's get into our text today. Let's read together verse 30 and 31. <clears throat> so they asked him, what sign will you give? <clears throat> what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they want a sign. They're asking for a sign. Hang on a minute. Didn't they just get the most amazing sign of the feeding of the 5,000 plus people? And then after that, they saw him uh, arrive at the other side of the lake when clearly he had not gone onto the boat and yet he arrived there. Haven't they already seen the miracles? What sign they're asking? No, they don't really want a sign. What they really want is some more food for their tummies because that's exactly what Jesus had said earlier in verse 26. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. They want a Messiah who's going to meet their needs, their physical needs. On my terms, to meet my earthly needs. Continuous bread, that's what we want, like, like Moses gave us the bread from heaven. But Jesus is not giving into this, and he's already resisted their attempts uh, to, to become an earthly Messiah. Back in chapter 6, verse 15, where they wanted to make him a king, a military king. He's resisted that and he's resisting that his, here now. They want to get another miracle out of him. And what they're really doing, they're really trying to put the responsibility of faith upon Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? It's the same thing that your unbelieving friends and family try to do I'd believe if I saw a miracle, he's got to show me. He hasn't done enough in showing me the creation of this world and by coming into history in the person of his son, no, no, I want to see, I want to see a bit here. Right? Or even people, you know, who, who will ask the questions like if, if God is real, if he could show me, if he could get me out of my financial problems, if he'll just get me out of, get me the right spouse or get me out of my marriage problem or get me out of, out of you know, my, give him the success I want, then, then I'll believe in him. Show me something, God, and I'll believe. The responsibility is on you. Well, Jesus is saying, no, no, it's the other way around. The responsibility to believe is on you, unbeliever, not on God. He's given us everything we need. That's what he says. Verse 36, read it with me. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. Did you get that? People who say to you, ah, oh, you know, 
If I was there and I saw those miracles, I would believe not necessarily. But Jesus is saying right here, well, you already saw miracles and you still don't believe. What Jesus is saying here, there's something bigger than just seeing miracles. It's about the heart. Read verse 33 with me. Bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. See what Jesus is on about here. He's telling them plainly that he's come to give them life, but what do they want? They want more bread. Now he's on about life. He's the bread of life. Not just to get your stomach filled or to get your... You're what you think you need right now in your life. It's interesting that Jesus says, I am the bread of life because uh, it's um, the word Bethlehem. The, the Hebrew is literally a uh, house of bread. Jesus says he's the bread of life. Now, I haven't seen any of the commentators mention that connection. House of bread, I am the bread of life. Whenever you've got anything that no one else has come up with, usually means you're a heretic, so we better be a bit careful here. But I'm just noting it, it's something of interest. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, house of bread, is the bread of life. <clears throat> Let's have a look at what he says in verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. So even if I give you the bread that you are asking for, you're still going to die. That's what he's saying. You need to hone in on what your real need is. You need to take hold of what I'm offering, not just bread for today and you die tomorrow. You need the bread of life. <clears throat> and what they're doing, is these opponents really is the same thing that human beings have continued to do throughout history and that is to deny what our real need is and to deny our mortality that we need life that we are going to die unbelievers even on their deathbed you know you'd think well Come on, this is it. You've been told you've got two days to live. Eh, if God's there, he should help me. Or, or you know, well, oh, look, I'm still hoping to pull through and get some more time. But they said you only got to, yeah, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm going to beat this. A denial. A denial of the fact of death. Jesus is not... Playing games here, with like trying to get them to guess a riddle, he's exposing what's inside their hearts. Just like those unbelievers on their deathbed. Yeah, God said, give me some more bread so I can live a bit longer here. A denial of death. As they said, verse 34, Sir, they said, Always give us this bread. He's just talked about life and now it's going on about just give me some more bread. <clears throat> I normally uh, address the children. This, this time, children, you don't have to listen. You can tune out in what I'm going to say. In fact, anybody who's under 40, you don't have to listen to this because you won't be able to understand it, Okay. I hope that'll make you listen even more. So I'm just going to address the older people. You are dying. You already know that. You've seen friends and loved ones die. You're next. How quickly did the last 10 years go? Wow, yeah. And you want to know the bad news? It goes even quicker, even if you live that extra 10 years. The end is close. 
Now, children, you don't get this, right? But you should get it. Young people, you don't get this, but you should get it. Andrew Simons, last night, cricketer, in a car accident. One time in Mildura, six teenagers walking down the street, 16-year-olds, all died with one car accident. It's not just elderly who die. But of course, you young people, you can't hear this because you think, it'll never happen to me, I'm okay. Young people are invincible, aren't they? Well, not always. But to those of us who are older, of course, we know, uh, we hope to last a bit longer, last the distance, as it were. We know the distance is short. The distance is short. We're dying. And I'll try not to look at anyone specifically when I say this, but all you've got to do is take a look in the mirror and you see those wrinkles and that loss of hair and stuff and you think old age is creeping up on you. It's not old age. It's death creeping up on you. Death is getting closer. You're watching yourself die. And you can try and cover it up and put on the makeup or comb the hair the right way. <laughs> Doesn't work. Doesn't work. A few more years. You know, I mean, modern medicine helps us push it along a little bit than maybe our forefathers, but only push on a little bit in the space of eternity. We go into shock when someone that we know passes away as though it is a shock, but as though it's not supposed to happen. But that is supposed to happen. That is what's happening. Do you know 6.2 million people died of COVID in the last two years? But here's something you didn't read in the headlines. 250 million people died. When? In that same period of time. 250 million people died in that same time. What they die of? Same stuff people are dying of, like car accident last night for Henry Simons, or this cancer or that, whatever it is. That's this world. that will be, Humanity is denying that these people here and opponents of Jesus were denying what their real need is. Life. Verse 49, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Give us the bread, give us the bread. Your ancestors ate the manna and they still died. It didn't help getting what you're asking for right now. Oh God, give me some more bread. Give me this, that's what I need. Now what you need is life. You know, those people in that wilderness, so long ago, an Old Testament story, so long ago, we sort of almost like those people are just a, a story. But they were real people. You know, those people in the wilderness, they had families, they had mothers and fathers and children. and They laughed, they cried, and they died. And they died. Death can be denied for a time. It's like someone gets diagnosed with cancer and they don't necessarily die that minute. We've got a terminal cancer. It's called sin. And that is why the wages of sin is death. But we don't die immediately. We're still here. And that's where this denial comes in. We're still here, aren't we? We're not dead yet. We could ask the same thing of, of in the Garden of Eden. Why, why did, you know, God said the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. But they didn't die physically. They did die spiritually immediately. But the process of physical death only began and they died a little later. Why is that? Same reason you're still alive now. This is the day of grace. This is the day of opportunity. 
to come to have life. Now we uh, we look at all the modern fathers of psychology or therapy and all the, you know, the, the Freuds and all these guys. But they're all dead. They didn't find an answer to the problem. They couldn't answer this problem that only Jesus has. Extra loaves of bread will not help you. Getting the things you want right now, you need life. Now in verse 40 and verse 44, Jesus talks about also the last day. See, that's what Jesus is really getting at here when he talks about those who will be raised up at the last day. What's Jesus getting at here? Where will you spend eternity? Will you have life, eternal life? Or will you receive the due penalty for the consequences of your sin, that is hell. They didn't get it. they still going, well, come on, give us some more bread. Verse 34. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They refused to deal with the real problem that they need in life. They refused to deal with what? Their sin. Their sin. They just want a, a genie messiah. Give me what I want. Give me the stuff I want. They're not looking at their sin. And we can, we can get easily caught up in that and, and, and think, well, not really look at our sin. Well, we've got a saviour, we can just go on. And not really look at how, like Leighton was praying, you know, how grievous our sin is in God's sight. One little thought. It's self-centred rather than God-centred. There's enough that Jesus would have to die on the cross for, for you to go to hell forever if you don't have life. When you sin, when you have a wrong thought, when you say a wrong word, when you do something, it's, it's coming from you in your flesh. And that's brought up a lot in our text. All the things, all the commandments you've ever broken have been done in your flesh. In your flesh. So that cancer is in your flesh. Sin. And all the extra bread is not going to help make cancer go away. It's not going to make sin go away. You know, right now, one of us could have cancer, it could be me, and we wouldn't even know. You could be, on the outside, look like you're okay. But of course, one day we'll show up, well, that's what sin's like. That's what sin is like. When you have sinned, it, it may not show up, the consequences of it may not show up. And you think, forgive and forget, that's all done and dusted. But one day, it's going to be exposed. What are you going to do? We've got this disease in our flesh. He calls it flesh all the time. If you've got lung cancer and you only got one lung, what do you need? You need a lung transplant. If you've got heart disease and it's not going to work much longer, you need a heart transplant. But what if sin has contaminated your whole body, your whole flesh. You need a whole body transplant. That is what the cross of Jesus is. The great transplant. The great substitute. His flesh for your flesh. His life for your life. That if you will put your trust in him, this transplant occurs. That's what Jesus is getting at. Read it with me in verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live 
forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He's talking about receiving him by faith, as he says elsewhere in this text. Whoever believes in me. He's talking about faith. Faith that is in Jesus and his work on the cross. To that flesh on the cross given for us. The transplant. So that on that day of judgment, God sees you in Christ. How does he look at you? Like through that lens, he sees a, your pure flesh, no cancer, no sin. Why? Because he's looking at you through Christ. But these guys here are just like people today. They got another agenda. It's like those people who <coughs> line up uh, you ever seen those, um, those uh, what do you call them, those uh, Maya stock take sales? You know, where people press their face up against the window, waiting to get in. And they have the window, they are killing each other to get one pair of cheap underpants. <laughs> what are you, kidding? And you think, who are these nutters? But hands up if you're one of them, eh? No hands. Oh, Tuss, was that you putting up? Oh, you're scratching your eye. That's okay. <laughs> See, I saw you at the my. I saw you on the TV. No, I didn't see you. But, but if it was you, if you really did go there, in another setting, you would appear quite normal. But when you got that agenda and you're going to get that bargain, suddenly you turn into a bit of a crazy person, and you're missing uh, all other logic. That's what's going on here. These guys are being told about life, and they're on about, can you give me some more bread? They were probably normally intelligent people in another setting, but they got such another agenda, they've missed the real point. Because we think we know what we need. We think we know what will satisfy we hunger for bread that still leaves us hungry. We hunger and thirst for things that are never going to fully satisfy. And, and we got this, this idea that this, this world and achieving, and it, and it keeps pounding us all through the week. That's why we have to come back in here each Lord's Day to praise God and get realigned with reality because the, the world, the lie, we go back into every week that tells us that success or financial stability or the right relationships or getting rid of my trials is what life is really all about. And I just got to get this and then I'll have everything. So that guy that, that made this uh, climb to the top of Mount Everest and then they made a big deal about this guy who he finally made it and when he got there, They'd run out of oxygen and he died at the top of Mount Everest. But all they're going, wow, but he's still a great guy. He still got there. Who cares? He's dead. He didn't have life. See, we think that life, well, if I was to ask you, what, what is life really all about right now? And you think practically how you'd answer that as to how you, when you get up in the morning, what your hopes and your dreams are. And you're going to say, life, what's, what is life? It's been happy, isn't it? Isn't life having comfort, the things that I want? Relationships, isn't that what life is about? Ha having having the, the right, my marriage being right or having the right marriage partner. Or isn't life about success or or achieving what I, what I, what I want to have, getting to that point where I can take my ease. What is life? What is life? See, 
What Jesus is talking about here is not, this has not been what you think it is. This has not been one of these doom and gloom messages, well, we're all going to die, so we've got to just hang around. Maybe if we can get, get Jesus, we'll get to heaven and get life. That's not what this message is about. It's not doom and gloom, you're all going to die, so just wait until you get to heaven. No, this message is about what truly life is. Life is not, even eternal life is not just after you die. Jesus is talking about what life is, and it'll go on unfolded even further later in this gospel, chapter 17, verse 3, where he says, this is eternal life. What is eternal life? To know Jesus. You see, life, what Jesus is talking about in our text today, is actually to know Jesus. That can begin now. Even with all those other trials and stuff, and I've still got to have bread and everything for my daily bread. Now, you can come to know Jesus through faith in him. And you're sitting there going, well, hang on, maybe I already know Jesus. Well, you want to enter into life, you need to know him more. And you know the beautiful thing about this life in Jesus? It goes on. You can grow in this. But what are you doing with your life right now? Where are the priorities? Is your hungering and thirsting? To have more of life, that is to know Jesus more. Or that Bible reading, you've got to squeeze that in some time and pray. Yeah, yeah. He says, asking you, you're a savior. Good, good. Um, but I've got to get some more bread. I've got some problems in my life. No, you need life. You need Jesus to know him more. That's what life is. And when you've truly got this life, this life that enters into a relationship. How did you get it? How did you get it? Because of the great transplant that went on. His flesh for your corrupted flesh. His pure, uncorrupted flesh for your sin-filled flesh so that you can have what? More bread? You know, the ironic thing is, he'll even give you that too. But first, first, you need life. Verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen.